our most gracious Heavenly Father. Nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to your cross I cling. Father, if you were to take your Holy Spirit from me, where would I be? I'd be groping in darkness. Prepare our minds and our hearts, but most of all, prepare the speaker. Speak your words. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. 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 You know, I just want to share a few things with you all from the Bible, as well as the spirit of prophecy in a few articles that I've been reading. You know, we're living in some serious times, so we all can attest to that fact. We are living in times in the toenail of the image. Things, prophecy is happening right before us, our very own eyes. Some people are walking around with their heads buried in the sand, not aware of what's going on. Events are not only taking place in the United States, but they're also taking place around the world, such as on June 10th of this year at the Vatican, the Pope, they, they had a human fraternity meeting. The Pope was there, his bishops and cardinals, 30 Nobel Peace Prize winners, environmentalists, school children, charity workers, as well as religious and global people from all the world, they came together to, they, they came together to present the theme on how to promote a global fraternity. The Vatican News reports, let me just say that, read this to you, but, but it's just the Vatican News reported. Let me get my eyeglasses here. It's at the World Meeting on Human Fraternity was held in St. Peter's Square on the 10th of June. It brought together artists, young people, charity workers. It was inspired by the Pope's encyclical letter, Fratelli Tutti. It brought together people from all around the world. One of the, the speakers who, were there, who, who was there was Filippo Grandi, who was the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. He said, we are glad to have the Pope, to, to join the Pope in this appeal for, for the half, you know, f human fraternity and peace. Now, now let me tell you, when, the, when, the, when they say peace, peace, what does the Bible say? Certain destruction, Certain destruction shall come upon them. It, it, it goes on to say, my brothers and sisters, that also they presented to the pontiff, they presented him of the human fraternity, you know, uh, document. And they launched a campaign to get one billion signatures on it. Now, what was the purpose of this? The purpose of this was what? To get people to know, hey, we support the Pope's agenda. And they want to get other people to follow and endorse the same thing. My brothers and sisters, the papal see the, the, the thing, they have not changed their agenda. They are the same. They, they, they want power, influence, and authority. This is all rooted in the doctrine of, of papal supremacy, which she says, we, I'm not only want to be in charge of religious things, but I also want to be over secular and temporal things. The of the prophecy tells us in Rome, and it said Rome will again, they, they, they will again gain their powers for papacy, and they will try to influence others to do the same. Revelation chapter Revelation, let's turn to that. I mean, you don't, you don't have to turn to me. I'm going to be going through some scripture. Okay, Revelation chapter 13, verse 2 says, And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Also in Revelation chapter 17, verse 13, it tells us, These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, 
Also in that same chapter, to, uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 17, it says, For God had put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Spirit of Prophecy tells us in the book Selected Messages, Volume 2, pages 367 and 368, it says, the, it says, the professed Protestant world will form a confederacy with the man of sin, and the church and the, and the world will be in corrupt harmony. Here the great crisis is coming upon the world. The scriptures teach that popery is to regain its lost supremacy. Amen. Brothers and sisters, can't we not see but what God's his divine revelations to us has brought out in, in the word of God and the spirit of prophecy, which points to current events that are happening all around us. That's why we need to, you know, to take, you know, when we look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 12, we need to take this into the prophetic events that's happening, my brothers and sisters. If prophecy is being fulfilled around us, you can rest assured that God's judgments are going to follow on the ungodly. Brothers and sisters, what's happening, that's why we need to get to say, God, we, and fall on our knees and say, Lord, we need to call people back to repentance, to repent and turn to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, when, when you look at it, what did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? He said what? Repent ye therefore, every one of you what? And be baptized. We are living in some serious times. The worldwide proclamation of the everlasting gospel in the context of, of the third angel's message in Revelation 14. This is our work, my brothers and sisters. God has called us to, to do, uh, uh, leading us to a second coming, to do a work for him. He called us to warn against the, the beast, the image, and his mark. And, and also he called us to, to obey all the commandments of God. Amen. This is the work of seven-day Adventists. Revelation, it says, Revelation chapter 13 tell, says that all the world wanted after the beast. In other words, all the world will be deceived. But it says, can we not see the things that are happening around us that it, it will behoove us to get our lives, not to be, get our lives, but have our lives in order because the investigative judgment is going on. The typical day of judgment is come going on, my brothers and sisters. And we, we can't, I mean, we can't just come here each and every Sabbath and act like nothing is going on outside of these walls. There's a lot going on outside of these walls, brothers and sisters, that we need to be aware of. How many churches are preaching that about the third angel's message? Then you go to them, what, you, you hear about the love the gospel. You hear that love, all you do is love God. That's fine and dandy, but, but we need more than that. And you got, we got to see there's a power. This, this is happening. What's happening here is that this is being directed by the spirit of devils. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14 tells us. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, we need to get familiar and be familiar with the things that are happening in prophecy that are leading up, that are going to happen just before the close of human probation. The Bible tells, the spirit of prophecy tells us in the, in the book, Great Controversy, page 573, it says, Protestants are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. It also says in Testimonies, volume seven, you know, to the, to the church, page 182, it says, the world is filled with storm and war and variance. Yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God and the person of his witnesses. This union is cemented by the great apostate. Also in the spirit of prophecy, it tells us in the book and in review in Hurl, March 9th, 1886, it says, there is one pointed out in prophecy as a man of sin, he is the representative of Satan, taking the suggestions of Satan concerning the law of God, which is unchangeable as his throne. This man of sin comes in and presents, represents to the world that he has changed that law, and that the first day of the week, instead of the Sabbath, is now the Sabbath. Here is Satan's right-hand man ready to carry on the work that Satan commenced in heaven that are trying to amend the law of God. And, and the Christian world has sanctioned his efforts. 
by adopting this child of the papacy, the Sunday institution. They have nourished it and will continue to nourish it until Protestants will get the hand, until she get a hand of fellowship to the Roman power. My brothers and sisters, if we only knew what was happening behind closed doors, I mean, what we, what we see here, this is a conspiracy, my brothers and sisters. It, it, it's to change the clear teachings of Scripture, but not only that, but to remove the principles of Christ himself. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6, where does it tell us? You don't have to turn that, but I'm going to say, it says, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother? and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What well, therefore God has joined together, one man and one woman, joined in holy matrimony, let no man put asunder. Brothers and sisters, the script, these scriptures are, this scripture is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's sad to say, though, brothers and sisters, that the, the Christ in this gospel is being abandoned. The truth is being compromised. You know, instead of the fear of God, people had to fear the fear of man. You know, human reason today supersedes the law of God. People, the, the people are now saying, you know, to, today human, they're saying misguided leaders today are just working and affirming the things that Jesus, that God has prohibited. The early church, my brothers and sisters, didn't condone sin or affirm sinners. That's not love. Amen. True love will, will call others away from the path of sin. But as it says, when you look at it, you know, we, are, we, are, we want to welcome everybody to the church. N nothing is more cruel than to let people know, to lie to people to them and withhold from them the truth of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ and from the word of God. But how many people are doing that? Some of their events, yes, we are welcoming people. When you say that, brothers and sisters, are we not welcoming people? Yes or no? Talk to me. <laughs> Maybe at some churches we might be, some of the churches we might not be. I don't know. We want to welcome all people. Is that not true? We want to welcome them what? Into heaven, right? We want to welcome to them to become part of the body of Christ in the commandment-keeping church. It's brought out in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. As well as Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. But, my brothers and sisters, we, 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 will, not, we will not have to welcome people to hell with an inclusive gospel that is so fixated on ignoring the moral teachings of God's word. Amen. What does the Bible say? Thy word have I what? Hid in my heart what? That I might not what? Sin against thee. Thy word is what? what? It's a lamp unto my feet, what? And a light unto my path. Jesus himself says what? Man should not live by bread alone, but what? what? Every word that cometh out of the mouth of God. John said, I know we I heard it in the Sabbath school this morning. John 1 it says what? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. You know, and, the, and then it goes on to say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. My brothers and sisters, we have to realize that the times that we're living in, instead of contending for the faith, and, and it's brought out in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, and resisting the militant homosexual lobby, it appears that many of us are caving in. Don't you know that the, home, the gay lobby is going to search and, and destroy mission, and they will not rest until every church, every school, and every institution is, is brought into the image of the LGBT. This is sad, my brothers and sisters. This is not happening. I'm not talking about in other churches. This is happening in our own church. Amen. And it's amazing how nothing's being said about it. People are just brushing it under the rug like nothing is happening. Let me read you what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Testimony to Volume 5, page 209. Listen to this. But that which causes me, this is the, the spirit of Pilate is talking. It's, let me say, it said, but that which causes me to tremble is the fact that those who have had the greatest light 
and privileges have become contaminated by the prevailing iniquity. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? Influenced by the unrighteous around them, many, even of those who profess the truth, have grown cold and are borne down by the strong current of evil. What the Bible says, even the greatest lights, the brightest lights are going to go out. The Bible says what? The love of many what? Shall wax cold. My brother says, yes, we must agree. God loves all people. God loves gays. He loves lesbians. He loves, he loves adulterers, fornicators. He loves thieves, murderers. He loves you know, liars, drunkards, and, and, and people. But, but why? Because we're all human. But, my brothers and sisters, Scripture tells us if we continue this sinful lifestyle, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11 tells us that. Brothers and sisters, the church is composed of people who have renounced their sins. That's what it was supposed to be, my brothers and sisters. It probably composed of people who have renounced their sins and, and turned their, from their, and turned unto God. This is what brought out also in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 27. It tells us all this, brothers and sisters. So, yes, my brothers and sisters, the church should be open so that sinners can come and hear the word of God and have an opportunity to become genuine Christians by forsaking and becoming born again into the image of God. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. You must be born of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us, and it says what? If any man is Christ, he's a new what? Creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. That means that our way of thinking, my brothers and sisters, uh, the, the way the things that come out of our mouth should become new. The places where we go should be new. The, places, the, the, the people that we hang around should be new. Everything should be new. Because why? We are walking in Jesus. Amen. And if you're walking in Jesus, you cannot sin, the Bible tells us. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, this is not happening. And Satan is laughing at us all. He rejoices because there's now his certain leaders in the church who are doing his work. He rejoices because he has certain leaders in the general conference who are doing his work. He rejoices because there's certain leaders in our local conferences who are doing his work. He rejoices because there are certain leaders in our institutions who are doing his work. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, the gay agenda is not only taking another the world, it is threatening God's very own people. And I ask you, whose side are you going to be on? There's no in-between here, my brothers and sisters. There's no straddling the fence here. We cannot remain neutral here. We cannot bury our heads in the sand. Let me tell you what the reason is, what the spirit of prophecy says. Listen to this. Toward the, this, this comes from Desire of Ages, page 805. Toward those who fall into sin, the church, I want you to listen to this carefully, the church has a duty to warn, to instruct, and if possible, to restore. Are you listening to me? Amen. Reprove, rebuke. Exhort, the Lord says, with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Peter Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Deal faithfully with wrongdoing. Warn every soul that is in danger. Leave none to deceive themselves. Call sin by its right name. Declare what God has said in regard to lying, Sabbath breaking, stealing, adultery, and every evil. He says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5 verse 21 says, if they persist in sin, the judgment you have declared from God's word is pronounced upon them in heaven. In choosing to sin, they disown Christ. The church must show that she does not sanction their deeds, or she herself dishonors her Lord. She must say about sin what God says about it. She must deal with it as God directs. And her action is ratified in heaven. He who despises the authority of the church despises the authority of Christ himself. 
I didn't say that. This came from the spirit of prophecy. Now, let me ask you, how many churches are calling sin by its right name? How many churches are dealing faith, you know, faithfully with wrongdoing? How many are, are, are trying to, 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 to sound the loud trumpet and, and spare not? How many churches are, are declaring what God says when it comes to lying, Sabbath breaking, and other evils? You tell me, how many churches are doing that? I know, I know here we're trying to do it here at the Seventh-day Sabbath church, but how many other churches are doing that? My brothers and sisters, let me just say this. The Billy Graham, you know, evangelistic, you know, association, which is a nonprofit, you know, outreach, you know, program, you know, and media to, you know, people, it, it, it helps those in disaster relief and it, it, it spread the evangelistic, the, the gospel all over the world. On May 16th of this year, they published an article titled, Taking Your Sabbath Back. And it featured Sissy Graham Lynch, the granddaughter of Billy Graham. Let me read you what she says on her podcast. She says, what do Sundays look like for you? I want you to listen to this. Are they a time to rest and recuperate? Or do you find yourself scrambling through the day, trying to get everything done before Monday morning? She goes on to say, Forsaking the Sabbath can leave us feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, and stressed. As a wife and mother of three, Sissy Graham Lynch shares her own struggle to prioritize this day of rest. Her latest episode on the Fearless Podcast encourages listeners to reclaim their Sabbath as a family. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? She says, why is this one of the Ten Commandments that we have no problem breaking in our lives and our relationship with the Lord? Good question, Sister Mrs. Lynch. Only problem is she said it for the wrong day, the first day of the week. She should have been saying it for the seventh day of the week. Amen. Why is this one of the commandments, my brother, sister, where we have a problem of not breaking and, and breaking our relationship with God? We can ask each and every one of us in this room that question. She goes on to say that, it's because our culture says it's okay. Our culture has redefined what Sunday should look like. She says, by missing out on a true Sabbath each week, we are also missing out on an opportunity to put God first, to experience rest, and to trust in him. God gave us a Sabbath for a reason, Lynch said on her podcast. When we don't take a day of rest, we will not be ready physically, spiritually, and emotionally to face the days ahead. Are you listening to what I'm just saying, brother? I said, what was this rant? Do you not think that we're living in serious times? We are living in times where Christ is coming, and he's coming back soon. Amen. Amen. But if I said, what the, what the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, they, they, they missed the, the case that everyone's health would benefit if we have Sundays off. Are you listening to me? At the same time, they want to set this day aside to reconnect with God. This is talking about worship, my brothers and sisters. And when you look at this, my brothers and sisters, this is, we, the BGA, BGEA is saying that we cannot recuperate or reclaim Sunday rest unless we preserve this day for worship. That is why the ultimate goal and reason they call Sunday desecration a breaking of the Ten Commandments. Oh, my brothers and sisters, if God gave us a Sabbath for a reason, and he did give us a reason, and if it's designed for our spirituality, then what we're hearing from the evangelical Protestants is that we are to preserve this day as a Christian Sabbath for both rest and worship. In other words, they're saying you cannot promote Sunday as a soul or secular play, practice, but rather as a rest based on religious principles. Are you listening to what, what, what was being said here, my brothers and sisters? Amen. And you're going to tell me that we're not living in some serious times? Listen, brothers and sisters, when we speak out against measures that pro will promote Sunday as a day of rest, we are promoting the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. 
When we oppose, my brothers and sisters, the, the, the Sunday observance, we are directly opposing, you know, hypocrisy, you know, for religious formalism and false doctrine. And my brother, I, you can see this is, you know, Sunday rest measures will soon have the support of the state. That's why God is so foresaw. You know, down when he looked down, you know, and he saw people having the form of godliness, what? But denying the power thereof from such turn away. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, he tells us. Brothers and sisters, setting Sunday aside to worship and rest is a form of worship, of godliness. It's devoid of God's power. Sunday rest lacks biblical support. And the conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's why Sunday's rest must be uh, something that's mandated by human law. Spirit of Prophecy tells us in the book, Great Controversy, page 578 and 579, it says, In both the old and the new world, the papacy will receive homage to the, uh, to the honor paid to the Sunday institution that rests solely upon the authority of the Roman church. Since the middle of the 19th, 19th century, students of prophecy in the United States have presented this testimony to the world. And the events now taking place has seen a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the prediction. What does the Spirit of Prophecy tell us? That things will be happening, what? Happening in rapid succession. That's not what's happening. And some of us, you know, we, all this is going around our heads. Some of us, we're in the same room with it. We, 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 we're not, in other words, brothers and sisters, we are not addressing the elephant in the room. And it's sad, my brothers and sisters. Let, this, this, the word of God tells, let me, let me finish that, that statement she, was, she said. She said, she also goes on to say, with Protestant teachers, there is the same claim of divine authority for Sunday keeping and the same lack of scriptural evidence as with the papal leaders who fabricated miracles to supply the place of a command from God. The assertion that God's judgments are visited upon men for the violation of the Sunday Sabbath will be repeated. Already it's beginning, beginning to be urged. And a movement to enforce Sunday observance is fast gaining ground. Well, it's just the Old Testament prophecies tells us. It make it clear that in the last days of human history, those who are loyal to God will be seventh-day observers. Are you listening to me? Isaiah, he says, and contemplating the end time, listen, he says, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1, he says, My salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. He declares in verse 2 of that same chapter, he says, Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath, from polluting it and keep of his hand from doing any evil. But since this blessed, you know, that it was not related as relating to the Sabbath leading up to the coming of Christ is not conferred on Jews only or on any singular class of people. He also says in that same chapter, Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7, he says, he goes on to say, also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we got to realize the end times that we're living in when men, women, and children are waiting for the coming of Christ, there will be a, a Sabbath reform message, a call to those who, to, uh, to, call to separate themselves from the world and, to, and to, to separate themselves not only from that, from all sin and evil that is happening in the world and to observe the true Sabbath, which is Jesus, uh, from Jesus Christ, and getting our messages from Jesus Christ. Because what other better person can you get your message from? The Bible says when Jesus said, what it said, and, and, and it says what? On the Sabbath day, as his custom, he what? Went into the sanctuary. Amen. 
That, that, and that wasn't talking about the first day of the week. When he did that, exactly, when he did that, that was for the seventh day of the week. But you see, the, the times that we're living in, things are being switched around, my brothers and sisters. Sad to say. Brothers and sisters, Satan is working today with the same weapons that he used, previously used in the past. Today, the arch deceiver is leading people to, 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 uh, against the will of God to the things that the apostles warned us against. Let's do evil that good may come, Romans chapter 3, verse 8 tells us. To put it another way, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says. As a result, many people today are being persuaded to break the Ten Commandments of the law, which is the Sabbath. That's why this brings this rebuke this to us when Paul says in and, 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 and Romans chapter 2, verse 23, he said, this makes it relevant, relevant to them when he says, through break, breaking the law, dishonor thou God. Brothers and sisters, breaking the law is a disgrace to God. Many Christians find that its justification is by grace. They don't need to cease sinning. That is, cease from transgressing the law of the Ten Commandments, the eternal standard of righteousness, by which James says is a law of liberty which we, uh, which we're going to be judged by. But it, 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 the Word of God says, you know, th th grace is a means to take away sins already committed. But it's by no means, a, it's not a license to help us keep sinning. But it says we're not supposed to have that once saved, always saved mentality. When you look at the law, but it says that we must keep the law, not to stop achieving justification for the, mis for the remission of sins of the past, Romans chapter 3, verse 25 tells us, but for the observance of the law does not remove sins, but rather we must observe it to avoid falling back into transgression again. Brothers and sisters, therefore, faith by which we are justified gives us power to henceforth establish and keep the law so that uh, as a justification, we do not fall back into sin. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, what? We establish the law. Romans chapter 3, verse 31 tells us. But yet we got some people walking around, moping around like they were in a funeral procession. Said, I feel guilty. I have sinned. I ate a a piece of cheese the other day. I ate uh, a slice of pie and it wasn't vegan. I ate between meals. I ate, uh, 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 I, I, ate you know, uh, I mixed fruits with vegetables. I, 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 I ate, you know, uh, uh, I was drinking with my meal. Going around confessing this to, uh, to each other. Instead of confessing this to Jesus Christ, the sin bearer, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes I wonder, have we not taken on the papal system when we confess our sins to mortal man instead of to Jesus Christ? Sometimes I wonder, brothers and sisters, you know, what, what, what are we doing when, when they're mortal and the Bible says, all have sinned, what, and come short of the glory of God. Let me read you what the Spirit of Prophecy says about this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Sometimes, I want you to listen to this carefully. Sometimes we pour our troubles into human ears and tell our afflictions to those who cannot help us and neglect to confide all to Jesus who is able to change the sorrowful way us to paths of joy. This is taken from Our Heart High Calling, page 97. Our brothers and sisters, I'm going to read you my last spirit of prophecy quote. I want you to listen to this carefully. From the pulpits of the day, today, the words are uttered, believe, only believe. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm, 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 fin I'm finishing up, though. Have faith in Christ. You have nothing to do with the old law. Only trust in Christ. How different is this from the words of the apostle who declares that faith without works is dead? He says, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James chapter 1 verse 22 tells us. 
We must have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul, my brothers and sisters. Many seek, I want you to listen to this, many seek to substitute a superficial faith for a rightness of life and think through this to obtain salvation. <clears throat> Brothers, my, my appeal to each and every one of us <laughs> is this. There are many who cry, believe, only believe. Now ask them, what are you to believe? The Bible says what the demons believe, what? And they tremble. Are we to believe the, the lies forced by Satan no, of God's holy word and his good law? Are we to believe that God, God has done away with his law? But no, he has established his law. Amen. But this is, you know, the, the, the word of God, no, no, let, to me, one of the greatest preachers who ever walked the face of this earth besides Jesus Christ himself was Paul. Let's hear what Paul has to say about this. Let's hear what his final decision was about this. I'm glad you asked. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Looking at verse 7. Beginning with verse 7. Romans chapter 7. Beginning with verse 7. Romans chapter 7. Beginning with verse 7. And when you have it, say amen. amen. I'm not going to start without you. Because this is important. Romans chapter 7. Beginning with verse 7. It says. Look, he starts out. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence or lust. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. What the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Amen. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but, but Christ liveth within me. We are told, brothers and sisters, we are to die to self daily. Not only daily, but all during the day. We are not to leave that door to crack open that Satan can get in. We need to pray each morning and say, uh, so every morning I got in the habit of saying, Lord, whatever you lead me to today, I want to be prepared for it. That's the kind of prayer we should have even when we get up on our knees before we walk out the door. Because I'm going to tell you, we got, if you're driving the freeway like I drive, you, know, you got you better be prepared for something. <laughs> Somebody's going to be cutting in front of you and you want to call you know, out of their name, say all kind of words. Let me give you an example. I was in the gym the other day working out. And, this, and I asked this guy, I said, uh, can I work with you out on uh, the, the, the machine? You know, he didn't answer me. He just ignored me like, you know, I didn't say anything. The old man in me, let me tell you, the old man in me wanted to say something, okay? Let me just say, I'm going to just tell, be honest with you. The old man when he, was just right under me. I said, no, I'm going to suppress that. Amen. I went over on the other side of the gym, all right? He comes all the way over from his side of the gym to my side of the gym and says, now, the wait is ready for you, brother. Now, what if I had stayed something out of line? I mean, and, and, and sometimes, brothers and sisters, we, the, the temptations arise. Brothers and sisters, I'm just letting you know, my brothers and sisters, we need to stop making excuses for sin. Amen. There is no excuse for sin. Sure, sin is pleasurable, or it wouldn't be sin. Brothers and sisters, we have, I hear so many people going around here saying this and that about sin. And Satan loves that. Why are we always making excuses for sin? Why are we always saying this or that? There is, I, mean, I can't say this enough, there is no excuse for sin. None, my brother says. You can't tell me there's an excuse for sin. But yet we're making so many excuses about it. Every time we walk around, places we go, we say, no, I'm feeling guilty about this and that. But don't we know that we have a sin bearer? The, but the word of God says that Jesus came to save his people, what? From their sins. Amen. It says, 1 John 1, 9 tells us what? If we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us our sins, what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. The Bible says, 1 John chapter 2, 1, it says, when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
So why are we going around making sin, you know, excuses for sin? Making this or that. Brothers and sisters, let me just tell you this. Let me just read, let me finish this scripture. Okay, where was I? I think I was in verse 2 or 10, uh, verse, uh, 10 now. Oh, I think I was just yeah, verse 9. Verse 10, that same chapter. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. I'm going to stop right here. So I'm going to stop right there. Before I read verse 12, I want us to hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I want us to hear what Paul, his decision that he came to, will to and he's going to say it in verse 12 right here. The conclusion that he came to, listen to this. He says, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. What, better, what kind of better conclusion than that? Amen. But and sisters, Peter tells us that we are to be holy as he who has called us what? Is holy. That means we are to be holy in our conversation and in everything. That doesn't mean that we are be, to be holy in front of the pastor and other Christian believers, but unholy in front of our supervisor and our co-workers. That doesn't mean that we are to be holy in, in the church parking lot, but unholy in Walmart parking lot. That doesn't mean that we ought to be riding around with Satan all during the week in a limousine and try to be holy. All of a sudden, when cyber, front set, front cyber, come Friday, come, the sun set cyber. That doesn't mean, but and sisters, that we ought to be holy in this sanctuary, but unholy when we're in the fellowship hall in the fellowship line. But and sisters, we ought to be holy each and every moment of the day. And many of us are missing the point. We ought to be, like, when it comes to sin, we ought to detest sin. It ought to be deplorable to us, brothers and sisters. It ought to be when you give it to your, your child, they make a face and say, mm, I don't want that. That's how we should do about sin. We should, it should be detested that when it happens, it will make us vomit, my brothers and sisters. We got to realize that every time we sin, we are crucifying Christ afresh on the cross again. We are putting him to open shame. How many of us think about that? And when we do, do we sin, when we sin, you're not just harming yourself, but we harm the community. And can you imagine what the angels are doing when we sin, how they're hiding their faces? Some of the places where we go, where the angels say, oh, no, he's doing that. Some of the thoughts that we have with Jesus, it, makes, it says, Jesus, in other words, we're telling Jesus, I don't care about your crucifixion. It doesn't matter to me what you did for me. And when you rose on the third day, it doesn't matter to me because every time we sin, that is what we're saying. We're saying, Jesus, your sacrifice didn't mean anything to me. Brothers and sisters, as I'm closing, my appeal is this. We serve a personal God. I mean, it's not right, right? We serve a personal God. Amen. So because we serve a personal God, I'm going to make my appeal personal. I'm going to be talking to myself. You are just eyewitnesses. You're just listening in. I'm telling God I want to reconsecrate my life. I want to dedicate my life fully and, control, and let you control me. I want you to become, you know, the, 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 the living vessel inside of me. I want to stop making excuses for sin. My brothers and sisters, if that's your plea, I'd like you to kneel with me, those who can kneel as we pray. And those, maybe some here who had heard this message for the first time, they want to take their stand for Christ or anything like that. If so, you can talk to Pastor Cortez or one of the elders. But at this time, let us kneel and pray to God and say, let him seal which has just been said and heard. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you on bending knee. We have so much to be thankful and grateful for. 
Father, thank you for Jesus who died on Calvary's cross for us. He died if it was just for Pastor Sanders. Lord, I ask you right now to come in, not only to the, into this building, but into each and every one of our hearts. Lord, let this mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us that we may keep our mind stayed on thee in order to have perfect peace. Father, in a world that's full of chaos and sin and war and, and, and that's going on, Father, we can still have peace in Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that we have someone that we can go to, a mediator, intercessor, our big brother, Jesus Christ. Lord, be with everyone on the sound of my voice. Help us, Father, that we will remain faithful until the end. And those who may still be alive when you come, help us to look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Amen. Father, help us that we will go through those pearly gates and we throw the crown down at your feet, saying, Heaven is cheap enough. Yeah. Father, most of all, help us that we will look and see Jesus face to face and we see the scarred hands, what you have done for us. And that we will sit at that table and say, Lord, Thank you. Help us all to have the faith and that, and that we may endure to the end. We pray this prayer, not our will, but your will be done. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen.